few brief remarks before I do the reading. Um, at this stage in my life, cancer scares the hell out of me, but it's really, up to this point, just been a big nuisance. That might change in the future. For many of you here, cancer has been much more than a nuisance. It's had a devastating effect on your health. For many others, it's taken away loved ones and left behind incalculable pain and heartache. I wanted very badly to find a way to make my remarks not about myself, but about all of us. As I began to write my sermon, I realized that I simply can't do that. All of our stories are very, very personal. But what I can do is look for a core, a core of reflection that speaks to all of us. I'll just leave it at that and let you decide if today's sermon succeeded or not. I'm making no claims that anything I say today will be anything terribly profound. I'll just share a very small piece of this big, ugly puzzle we call cancer. I've heard about the, uh, the emperor of all maladies uh, quite some time ago. Actually, I first found out about it when I noticed a PBS series with the same title. When I decided on this topic for the sermon, I wanted a book that could be as close to what I call a big picture as I could find. This one fits the bill, and I hope my readings pique your curiosity enough to read it later. It's equal parts history, a gripping detective story, and many moving stories of cancer patients in their unending struggles. I'm going to give you a small taste of this book, but two little tidbits that I wanted to share. The first record of cancer was found on a papyrus writing uh, dated to 2500 BC. Uh, it contains the writings of an early Egyptian physician named Imhotep, and more than two millennia would pass before there are any additional mention of cancer in historical records. The other thing I was curious about is just the word cancer. The first term for cancer appeared in uh, medical literature around 400 BC. It was the Greek word karkinos, which means crab. And you can see in the book, that's what he has as the symbol on the, on the front. It wasn't the physical appearance of the crab that made it appropriate. It was the general idea that the crab's actions included digging its body deep inside the sand and grabbing a wide swath of territory with its legs. I have been up since 3 o'clock this morning. I, the hardest part of this morning for me is choosing a reading from this book. I had four readings that I chose, and I can't do all of them. Two of them are very emotional, and I'm, I'm not going to do either of those. I'm going to give you a story uh, that I found very fascinating. I'll give you the kind of the setup. It's 1948. There is a famous cancer researcher named Sidney Farber, and he meets a fellow named Bill Coster, who is involved in show business. He's involved in a group called the, um, the Varsity Club of New England. They started the uh, Children's Cancer Center Research Fund in Boston in 1948. Now, they needed a post child. So uh, they found a little boy, and uh, the problem finding a poster child was finding a child that looked like a poster child, somebody that was fairly healthy looking. And they did find a, a little boy, and his name was uh, Einar Gustafsson, but they renamed him Jimmy. Now, the way the story goes is there's a radio show back then called uh, Truth or Consequences, and it was hosted by a guy named Ralph Edwards, who I remember he used to do uh, This Is Your Life. That's the one. Yes. Yeah. So he was on the radio doing this show called uh, Truth or Consequences, and um, so he, he did this special radio program, and what happened was he... He kind of piqued the audience's curiosity, and then he brought the boy on the air. 
and he finds out that the boy is a big fan of the Boston Braves, and then all the Boston Braves come in the hotel room, and this is all going out over the air, of course. Everybody's just loving every minute of it. And um, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about what happens at the end of the program. The crowd in Edward's studio cheered, some noting the poignancy of the last line, nearly moved to tears. At the end of the broadcast, the remote link from Boston was disconnected. Ed Edwards paused and lowered his voice. Now listen, folks, Jimmy can't hear this, can he? We're not using any photographs of him or using his full name, or he will know about this. Let's make Jimmy and the thousands of boys and girls who are suffering from cancer happy by aiding the research to help find a cure for cancer in children. Because by researching children's cancer, we automatically help the adults and stop it at the outset. Now, we know that one thing Jimmy really wants the most is a television set to watch the baseball games. If you and your friends send in your quarters, dollars, and tens of dollars tonight to Jimmy for the Children's Cancer Research Fund, over $200,000 will be contributed to this worthy cause. Let's see that Jimmy gets his television set. The broadcast lasted eight minutes. Jimmy spoke 12 sentences and sang one song. The word swell was used five times. Little was said of Jimmy's cancer. It lurked unmentionably in the background, the ghost in the hospital room. The public response was staggering. Even before the Braves had left Jimmy's room that evening, donors had begun, begun to line up outside the lobby of the children's hospital. Jimmy's mailbox was filled with postcards and letters, some of them addressed simply Jimmy, Boston, Massachusetts. Some sent dollar bills, Children mailed in pocket money, quarters and dimes. The Braves pitched in with their own contributions. By May of 1948, more than $231,000 had rolled in. Hundreds of red and white tin cans for donations for the Jimmy Fund were posted outside baseball games. Cans were passed in baseball uniforms. They went door to door with collection cans. Jimmy days were held in small towns throughout New England, and Jimmy's promised television, a black and white set with a 12-inch screen set into a wooden box, arrived and was set up on the white bench in his room. In the fast-growing, fast-consuming world of medical research in 1948, that amount of money, $231,000, was impressive, but still a modest sum. It was enough to build a few floors of a new building in Boston, but far enough to build, far from enough to build a natural, national scientific edifice against cancer. In comparison, in 1944, the Manhattan Project spent $100 million every month at Oak Ridge. In 1948, Americans spent more than $126 million on Coca-Cola alone. But to measure the genius of the Jimmy campaign in dollars and cents is to miss the point. For Farber, the Jimmy Fund was an early experiment, the building of another model. The campaign against cancer, Farber learned, was much like a political campaign. It needed icons, mascots, images, slogans, the strategies of advertising as much as the tools of science. For any illness to rise to political prominence, it needed to be marketed, just as a political campaign needed marketing. A disease needed to be transformed politically before it could be transformed scientifically. If Farber's antifolates were his first discovery in oncology, then this critical truth was his second. It set off a seismic transformation in his career that would far outstrip his transformation from a pathologist to a leukemia doctor. The second, the second transformation from a clinician to an advocate for cancer research reflected the transformation of cancer itself. The emergence of cancer from its basement into the glaring light of publicity would change the trajectory of the story. It is the metamorphosis that lies at the heart of this book.
The story starts with the father, the son, and the unholy guest. My dad picked a hitchhiker up. It was sometime in the late 1970s, I believe. The hitchhiker proceeded to successfully convince my father that he needed a place to stay for the night. Dad was a very kind man, and he offered the hitchhiker a meal in a living room sofa. That was a big mistake. This man, all my father knew him as was Mr. C, ended up staying too long. Dad tried kicking him out. In addition to everything else about him that was awful, he never took a bath or a shower. After he left, the stink lingered on. In a manner of speaking, he never really left. Well, a little over 40 years passed, and wouldn't you know that the same thing happened to me. This scruffy-looking man was hitchhiking one night on a dark road. It was really cold, and I stopped to give him a ride. He told me he was out of work. He hadn't eaten in three days. I took him home. I gave him some hot soup and a spare air mattress. The SOB wouldn't leave. (laughs) When I finally got him out of the house, all he left behind was a big bag of lemons. A very odd way of showing his thanks. And I kept peering out the front window, expecting him to show up again. Thus endeth the wacky, quasi-metaphorical introduction. I will... (laughs) No, I will translate. (laughs) Dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer in the mid-1980s. He was nearing his 65th birthday, and he was getting ready for retirement. Like a lot of men of his generation, he hadn't been paying much attention to his health. I don't remember much about what happened and in which order it happened, Well, basically, the abbreviated version goes like this. About three years after he was diagnosed, he had a stroke. And then the cancer ended up metastasizing into his hip. I have some very painful memories of watching my father in in agonizing pain that I couldn't begin to fathom. I do remember praying that his suffering would end, and it did, about three months before his 70th birthday. I made a vow at that point to keep an eye on my prostate. I began getting yearly physicals starting in the early 1990s. Many of you know about PSA tests, but those of you who don't, it is a blood test that checks the level of the protein-specific antigen, PSA, in your body. It was drummed into me into my head that once that number reached 4.0, I should become concerned. I watched the number slowly rise steadily over the years, and eventually it hit the 4.0 mark around 2010. Then it went up some more. Then it went down again. Around 2015, my regular doctor told me it was time to see a specialist. Later that year, my first trip to the urologist yielded a PSA score that was 10.8. We rechecked it about a month later, and the PSA had dropped, but it was still 9.7, and that was clearly high enough to, I mean, it was time for a biopsy. The other term that all men with prostate cancer learn about is the Gleason score. Um, and the, of the 12, 12 samples taken in the biopsy, eight of them were negative. Three had Gleason scores of six, and one was a seven. And that meant it was time to pursue treatment opera, uh, options. The three most common routes are surgery, radiation, or radioactive seed therapy. I was leaning toward the third option when my urologist informed me of a fourth option, which is called SBRT. Some people call it cyberknife technology. It involves five sessions of 
highly focused radiation instead of the regular treatments, which take close to 30. My treatment ended in the middle of June of last year. Uh, six months later, my PSA dropped to 1.75. I was extremely relieved. It was time for a life-affirming ritual. I got a BLT from Merits. <laughs> my whole experience with cancer was something that I could see coming. I have two older brothers, and I figured that the genetic odds favored at least one of us being saddled with it. I do remember, as I watched the PSA numbers rise every year, doing a little dress rehearsal in my head about how I would deal with a prostate cancer diagnosis. I was absolutely certain that I would be falling apart. Strangely enough, when I got the call from my urologist in 2016, I didn't do much of anything except simply say, we'll deal with it. At that point, I had made up my mind I wasn't going to be scared. I was simply going to take it as it comes. Along the way, I did a lot of reading. A great deal of it was informative. But as the information began to pile up, confusion took hold. You could choose any kind of prostate cancer you wish. You could read 30 reports from doctors, clinics, and patients, and you would get 30 completely different takeaways. My cancer was on the lower side, and I had more options, so it gave me the time to think about it. That was a good thing, but it also meant that I could spend even more time gathering even more information and you can see where this goes. It just never ends. When I first broached this topic with Tom a few months back, my initial idea was to have maybe three people, and we would have a shared sermon. So I had to ask myself, who would I ask? And then it hit me, who couldn't I ask? I'm absolutely certain that every single person in this, in this sanctuary has had cancer touch their lives. It's, it's, you've had it, a family member's had it, a friend has had it, a fellow worker, a fellow church member, especially prostate, breast, and colon cancers. When you live with cancer, you want to read more than just a bunch of data. Sooner or later, this is what happened to me. I wanted to know more about cancer, the history of cancer. The Emperor of Maladies reads on several levels. It's an exhaust exhaustively researched and well-written timeline of the pivotal pages in Mr. C's biography, but it is also the stories of individuals touched by cancer written with great passion by a doctor who is down in the ditches engaging in a never-ending battle. I use a lot of metaphorical language when I teach my students. An example would be B.B. King, the great blues guitar player. I say that his guitar playing is analogous to the writing style of a short story writer that I admire named Raymond Carver. Now, if you want to know more, you have to come for a guitar lesson and I will demonstrate. <laughs> but for now, I want to talk about a metaphorical device called personification. I call this book a type of biography, and this is what the author says about it. In writing this book, I started off by imagining my project as a history of cancer, but it felt inescapably as if I were writing not about something, but someone. My subject daily morphed into something that resembled an ind individual and enigmatic, boy, I need some coffee this morning, if somewhat deranged image in a mirror. This was not so much a medical history of an illness, but something more personal, more visceral. It's biography. Have you ever noticed when reading an obituary of someone, 
in the newspaper who met their demise due to cancer. There's always a mention of a battle or a struggle. These words conjure up not a thing, but a being that the deceased was engaged with. For Siddhartha Mukherjee, who wrote this book, it's an ominous emperor who rains down his pain with not one hit of humanity. For me, it's a nasty guy named Mr. C. He, he leaves nothing behind but wreckage and a terrible smell that you can never entirely eliminate. I've often thought of other ways of manifesting Mr. C. One of my favorites is Mr. C as a piñata. <laughs> that would be fun for a few seconds. <laughs> now, a while back, I, I took a trip to one of my favorite places, uh, Ocracoke. When I leave the mainland, I take the Swan Quarter Ferry, which takes close to three hours to get to Ocracoke. I started thinking about that ferry ride as a metaphor for human life. When you leave, you are watching Swan Quarter slowly fade out of view. Then there's a period in the journey when you can see absolutely nothing but water. There's not really anything on the horizon to indicate that this trip will be ending. In other words, you're immortal. Well, about an hour before you reach Ocracoke, you can start to see the faint outline of the water tower that is the tallest thing in the village. Like that right there. See that? Oh, my goodness. I guess I'm not immortal. <laughs> then maybe in another half hour, you can make out the lighthouse. Wait a minute. I guess this means I'm too late. It's too late to change careers. <laughs> I guess I can't be a fireman after all. So, About a quarter hour later, you can begin to make out the length of the shoreline. <laughs> Wilson. So, let's see here. Let's see. Obituaries, page two. Okay, all right. Here, here. Right and then. Finally, you can see Silver Lake coming into view. <laughs> well, I guess I'd better do it while I'm here. How in the world is he going to work a volleyball into a sermon? That's really <laughs> interesting. The lyrics that Phil Oaks wrote for that song really embody a lesson that I might have understood intellectually when I was in my 20s. But at the age of 64, in dealing with Mr. C, they really hit me much, much harder. They're bull-faced now. I fully grasp that life is finite. When I go to the movie theater, I automatically get the senior discount. They don't have to ask me anymore. <laughs> I'm a bona fide old guy now. That doesn't mean I don't anticipate having good days ahead of me. I certainly hope I'm around for as many years as I can. There's a side benefit to fully understanding mortality, and that is that life gets sweeter as I get older. I notice that I cry much more easily than I did when I was younger. I feel life much more deeply. My story added another page in early May when I went back to get my second PSA checkup. Anyone that has lived with cancer knows that you get into this routine of living your life in three-month or six-month bites. You have a recheck. If the results are positive, you exhale and you can relax for a few more months. If the results aren't positive, then you ramp up the angst. 
My PSA unexpectedly spiked back up to 4.7. The doctor told me not to panic because PSA tests can be very fickle and we would do a recheck at the end of the summer. So this story continues. There's not a period but an ellipsis on the last sentence written in my wife's book. Now, I would never, ever thank Mr. C for anything. He is nothing more than a dirty, rotten scoundrel. He left me something really bitter, but I cannot throw it out. I have to acknowledge the presence. I'm really the only one that can try and make it sweet. I will put in as much sugar as it takes, and truly grasping the finite nature of life makes it essential for me to simply enjoy living in the moment. That leads me to the end of this message. I'd like you to notice on the front of your order of service, you might see this picture here. Everybody see that? I actually went through three ideas for the front of the order of the service. The first was a picture of the word cancer being erased. The second one was a picture of some lemons, you know, like in a little bottle. But I ended up choosing this one. And you're probably wondering what in the world this has to do with the, with the topic. So let me explain. This woman's name was Betty Shushman. How many of you have seen this picture? Okay, it's fairly viral. Okay. She lived in Boston, and this photo was taken at a premiere of a movie called, uh, I think it was called Black Mass, a movie by, uh, with uh, Johnny Depp. There was a, uh, like a debut party, and all these people are catching a picture of Johnny Depp. And here is Betty Shushman, right here. See what she's doing? She's living in the moment. See that? This is what they wrote in the Boston Globe when she died earlier this year. You've likely seen her before. She leans forward with her arms crossed against the barricade, clad in magenta glasses that match the accents of her black shirt. Her white hair and pallid complexion stand out among the younger, rosier folk in her midst. The people around her snap some, some unknown scene on their smartphones, their arms lifted, necks craned, fingers ready on the shutter. Many in the background are little more than a screen and a pair of hands, but the elderly woman simply takes it all in with a tight-lipped smile, like a contemporary Mona Lisa in her golden years. She's living in the moment. So, if Mr. C worms his way back into my life, here's how I'm going to respond. I'm going to have him sit on the couch, then I'm going to sit down in front of him, and I'm going to eat a Merritt's BLT. <laughs> and I'm going to make it a double to rub it in. He won't get one scrap of that sandwich, and I'm going to live in and enjoy that moment. Then I'm going to wash it down with a big glass of Mr. C's lemonade. All right. Amen. Blessed be.